Hello, my name is Guy Sterling. I'm a retired newspaper reporter and longtime resident of Newark, New Jersey, who enjoys researching and writing about the city's history. Today's topic is the Irish in Newark, how and when they got here, what they did when they arrived, what's happened to them since, and those who made a name for themselves. So let's get started. Newark was founded in 1666 by Puritans from Connecticut who ventured south in search of, as one author put it, quiet lives ruled strictly by God and the Bible. This was well before the American Revolution, Declaration of Independence, the U.S. Constitution, the establishment of Washington, D.C. as the nation's capital, and the Civil War. The fact is, there are very few major cities in the country older than Newark, which, for example, is older than San Francisco, New Orleans, and Philadelphia, to name but a few. As a result, Newark has a history longer and richer than most American cities, a history that has been marked by many waves of immigrants heading to our border from a variety of foreign lands for a better life. While there were some Irish in Newark going back to the late 18th century, they didn't start arriving in significant numbers until Ireland's potato famine that lasted from 1845 until 1851. And obviously, it wasn't just Newark where the hundreds of thousands of Irish residents who left Ireland desperate for new lives in America during that crisis ended up. The Irish didn't exactly get a warm reception in New Jersey, nor in most of America for that matter, and they faced severe prejudice, poverty, and disease, especially cholera. To get by, they had to rely on each other, ethnic and civic organizations, and also the Catholic Church, since many of the newly arrived Irish were Catholics. But more than anything else, they relied on politics and the benefits and perks that politics can provide to survive, get ahead, and maybe even prosper. By 1910, a total of 36,000 people living in Newark, just over 10% of the city's population at the time, had either been born in Ireland or were born to Irish parents. That number of residents and potential voters provided Newark's Irish with a base solid enough to take care of themselves with jobs, businesses, and a range of community organizations in the neighborhoods where they settled. Newark's first Irish mayor was Charles Gillen, who served from 1917 to 1921. There were two other Irish mayors after that, Vincent Murphy and Leo P. Carlin. Murphy served for two terms in the 1940s, while Carlin served from 1953 until 1962. Carlin was the last mayor to serve under a form of government where the mayor was not directly chosen by the people, and the first to be chosen when they could. In the earlier form of government, voters elected five commissioners to run the city. Newark also had one of its Irish-American citizens elected governor of New Jersey, and another elected a U.S. senator. The governor was Franklin Murphy, who was elected for a single term right after the turn of the 20th century. Murphy gets high marks as a leader, and there's a statue of him in Newark's Wequaic Park. Also, the large brick varnish company that Murphy and his family owned and operated on Chestnut Street, just east of McCarter Highway in Newark, was restored and has opened as an apartment building. It's worth checking out if you want to get some idea of what Newark looked like in its heyday as one of America's industrial powers. There were literally dozens of such buildings around the city at one time, many of them much larger than the Murphy Varnish Company. A handful remained standing, either as repurposed buildings or abandoned structures. The Irish U.S. Senator from Newark was James Smith, Jr., who served in the Senate for six years at the end of the 19th century. He was a leather manufacturer and owned two local newspapers. The men from Ireland who immigrated to Newark and could find work mostly got jobs as laborers on the railroad, the canal, or roadways that were so vital to the city's commerce, as well as jobs in the quarries along the Passaic River that once made Newark famous. Over time, the Irish would come to own some of those quarries. Others were successful in carrying their trades with them across the ocean and setting up shop here, making products such as coaches for horse-drawn carriages or hats, to name a couple of businesses. The Irish were also school teachers, publishers, 
builders, bankers, police officers, firemen, civil servants, and of course, Catholic priests. In time, as the United States grew and Newark prospered, so did the city's Irish residents. Later Irish immigrants to Newark were often sent money to have in their pockets as they made their passage across the ocean, along with the promise of a place to stay and a job, or a place to learn a trade as they got on their feet in America. The idea was to give the newly arrived a hope of making a living here above the pay grade of a laborer. While the Irish in Newark were scattered throughout the city, they also gathered in several distinct neighborhoods. In North Newark, not far from the Passaic River and the Irish-owned quarries, in the Ironbound section near South Street, and in the Central Ward near where University Hospital sits today. And of course, there was the Valesburg section of Newark that grew into an Irish enclave as construction of a now long gone trolley line made that part of Newark out near the South Orange border more accessible. Along with the growth of the Irish in Newark in the 19th century was a proliferation of Catholic churches in the city. St. John's on Mulberry Street, not far from N.J. Pack, is New Jersey's oldest Roman Catholic church, with its church built and dedicated in 1828. St. Patrick's Pro Cathedral at the corner of Washington Street and Central Avenue, the original cathedral of Newark, is another. There was an equally impressive early Catholic church in Newark that sadly is no longer standing, and that was St. James Church at Lafayette and Jefferson Streets in the Ironbound. The spot on which it stood is a parking garage today. As the 20th century wore on, the Irish influence in Newark began waning. By the census of 2000, the number of Newark residents of Irish descent had dropped all the way down to 2,500, less than 1% of the city's population. It is, no doubt, even lower today. It's not so much that the Irish vanished as it was they moved elsewhere in Essex County to other parts of New Jersey and across the country as they gained an economic standing and sought the comfort, space, and peace of suburban living. Pretty much where you find a St. Patrick's Day parade today, you'll find a healthy population of Irish. Newark, however, is an anomaly. The city's annual parade, the oldest in New Jersey, is more about what was than what is. Those with Irish blood in them, still in Newark, hope it's a tradition that never ends. I'd like to conclude this program by briefly listing 20 highly distinguished Irish Americans who resided in Newark sometime during their lives. All may not be household names, but I can assure you, at one time or another, these were people of great renown, both in the United States and abroad. From the world of law, there is William J. Brennan, Jr. and Frederick Lacey. William Brennan was the son of Irish immigrants who graduated from Barringer High School in Newark, the University of Pennsylvania, and then Harvard Law School. He was appointed a Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court by President Eisenhower, serving from 1956 until 1990, and he played a key role in the court's expansion of individual rights. He had previously served as a state court judge in New Jersey. There is a bronze statue of Justice Brennan at the top of the steps of Essex County's Hall of Records in downtown Newark. Frederick Lacey was the son of a Newark police chief. He went to Westside High School in Newark and Rutgers University before graduating from Cornell Law School. Lacey began his legal career in private practice and then took a job as an assistant in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Newark, an office he would head from 1969 until 1975, leading major cases against organized crime and public corruption. He also served as a federal judge in Newark for 15 years before retiring and returning to private practice. From the world of sports, there are Joseph Ironman McGinnity, Paul Bucky O'Connor, and Richie Regan. Ironman McGinnity is a Hall of Fame baseball pitcher who picked up his nickname from working in a foundry in the offseason, and also for pitching professionally into midlife. Twice, he won 30 games in a season and was a member of the 1905 World Series champions. He retired as an active player when he was 54 years old and was elected to the National Baseball Hall of Fame in 1946. 
He won almost 250 games in his career. Bucky O'Connor played college football at Notre Dame for the school's legendary coach, Newt Rockney, and as a running back, rushed for 100 yards in Rockney's final game, a win over USC. That victory capped the team's second consecutive season without a loss and clinched the college football championship for Notre Dame in 1930. O'Connor played himself in a movie about Notre Dame football under Rockney entitled The Spirit of Notre Dame. He later became a doctor and practiced in Newark for more than a half century. Richie Regan was an All-State basketball player at Westside High School in Newark who later starred for Seton Hall and in the NBA. His 1953 Seton Hall team was ranked second in the country and he was voted MVP of the college All-Star game played after the season. Regan was a first-round NBA pick and played pro for three years. He was an NBA All-Star's final season. Following his playing days, he held a variety of athletic and fundraising positions at Seton Hall University. From the military are Stephen and Philip Carney. Stephen Carney and his nephew Philip are two of the most respected military officers the United States has ever had, both attaining the rank of Major General. Stephen commanded U.S. troops in the West as the United States was growing and adding land west of the Mississippi before the Civil War. Philip, 20 years younger, fought in the Mexican-American War and Civil War and established a reputation as one of the most fearless soldiers ever to wear an American military uniform. The town of Kearney, right across the Passaic River from Newark, was named for the Kearney family, and there's a statue of Philip Kearney in front of the Kearney Post Office and also in Newark's Military Park. From the business world, there is Thomas McCarter. Thomas McCarter was born in Newark and became a lawyer, starting his career at his father's law firm. He also served as a judge, a state senator, and state attorney general in New Jersey before organizing the Public Service Corp of New Jersey in a merger of trolley companies and a power company. Eventually, the company became a well-known public utility, public service, electric, and gas. McCarter served as its president for 36 years before resigning in 1945. McCarter Highway in Newark is named for him, and the family's name remains on one of Newark's most prestigious law firms, McCarter & English. From the world of religion, there are Bishop James Roosevelt Bailey and Monsignor William Linder. An Episcopalian minister who converted to Catholicism, Bishop James Roosevelt Bailey came from a family that included America's first native-born saint, Elizabeth Ann Seton. He turned to religion after first planning for a career at sea. He was ordained a priest in 1844, first working as a college administrator and then a church official. Bailey was consecrated Newark's first bishop in 1853. He organized the Newark Diocese and also got its college, Seton Hall, off the ground. He later served as Archbishop of Baltimore. Monsignor William Linder was a Catholic priest who held degrees from Seton Hall and Fordham. After the civil unrest in Newark in 1967, he founded a new community corp to provide housing, job training, health care, and other services to the city's underprivileged. In 1991, he was given a MacArthur Award for Extraordinary Achievement. The pastor of Newark St. Rose of Lima Church for more than 30 years, he received many honorary degrees, served on government boards, and gave expert testimony at hearings. He also wrote extensively and taught college courses. From the world of labor, there is Tom Giblin and the Giblin family. The son of an Irish immigrant, Thomas Giblin followed his father into labor and politics becoming an official with the International Union of Operating Engineers. In addition, he has served as the surrogate of Essex County, a county freeholder, and chairman of New Jersey State Democratic Party from 1997 to 2001. He's also been elected to the State Assembly, where he has served as Deputy Majority Leader. Giblin has a degree from Seton Hall University, done graduate work at Rutgers, and served in the New Jersey Air National Guard. His brother, Vince Giblin, was general president of the IUOE. From the world of medicine, there is Dr. William O'Gorman. 
Well, Gorman was a well-known American doctor when, in 1885, he sent four Nork boys to France for Louis Pasteur's newly discovered rabies treatment. That made him an international figure. He was born in Ireland and trained as a doctor there and set up a practice in Newark after coming to the U.S. in 1849. During the Civil War, O'Gorman was appointed chief physician for New Jersey soldiers returning from battle. He was the first medical director of St. Michael's Hospital in Newark and was elected both Essex County physician and president of the county's medical board. From the world of journalism, there is Joseph Atkinson and Rachel K. McDowell. Joseph Atkinson came to the U.S. from Belfast and had a long career in America as a reporter and editor. He also served as Newark City Clerk and Clerk of the Essex County Board of Freeholders. He began his career on the staff of the New York Herald as its correspondent in Newark. He was also editor of the Newark Journal, the Free Press, and the Sunday Standard, along with the Prudential Insurance Company's in-house publication. In 1878, he published a history of Newark that was used as a textbook in the city school system. Rachel McDowell began her career as a society reporter in Newark before joining the New York Herald and the New York Times. She was employed at the New York Times from 1920 to 1948 and was the paper's first religion editor. While there, she developed a national reputation and was nicknamed the Lady Bishop. She had her own radio program and lectured on religious issues throughout the country. McDowell was a strict Presbyterian who never married and started an organization to keep newspaper stories free of offensive language. Her father was William Osborne McDowell, a Newark businessman known internationally for numerous projects that promoted freedom, democracy, and world peace. From the world of architecture, there is Jeremiah O'Rourke. Jeremiah O'Rourke was born and educated in Dublin before coming to the U.S. He founded two architectural firms in Newark that carried his name, and he made his reputation designing Catholic churches and schools. He had a hand in designing the Basilica of the Sacred Heart on Clifton Avenue in Newark, among other churches in the area, as well as the main building of what was then Seton Hall College, now University. In 1893, O'Rourke was appointed supervising architect of the U.S. Treasury, where he designed federal buildings throughout the country, many of them post offices. From the world of politics, there are Dennis Carey, James R. Nugent, and Bernard Shanley. Dennis Carey was the chairman of the Essex County Democratic Party from 1953 to 1968, a period when he was instrumental in turning the county Democratic. Equally important, Carey delivered enough votes out of Essex County for John F. Kennedy to win New Jersey's electoral votes in the election of 1960, without which Kennedy would not have captured the presidency. A Newark native and city fire commissioner, Carey continually battled with Democratic state officials in Trenton for the patronage he felt Essex County deserved for its party loyalty. He fought off two late-life challenges to his leadership before retiring and died in 1973 at the age of 69. James R. Nugent entered politics in Newark after going to college, studying for the law, and becoming an attorney. He rose quickly through the ranks to become head of the Democratic Party in Essex County and state party chairman, as well as Newark's City Corporation Council. Nugent's influence extended to the highest levels of government, and he helped Woodrow Wilson's ultimately successful presidential bid get off the ground before the two split. Nugent opposed prohibition and also a woman's right to vote. His prominence started fading as the star of Jersey City Mayor Frank Haig began ascending. Nugent lost the Democratic primary for governor in 1919, couldn't get the state Senate to confirm his appointment as Essex County prosecutor, and ended his career failing to get elected a Newark City Commissioner. He died in 1927 at age 62. Bernard Shanley was born in Newark and went to St. Benedict's Prep, Columbia University, and Fordham Law School. After serving in World War II, he began his political career in the late 1940s 
as counsel to the New Jersey Republican State Committee. He joined the presidential campaign of Dwight Eisenhower in 1952, and after Eisenhower's election as president, served as Eisenhower's special appointment secretary and deputy chief of staff in the White House for five years. He later founded a law firm in New Jersey and was its senior partner. From the world of construction, there is Edward Waldron. Edward Waldron came to the U.S. from Ireland as a teenager. After taking jobs here as a weaver and brick mason, he started his own construction business in Newark that put up buildings throughout the East and the Midwest. In Newark, his company built City Hall, the Basilica of the Sacred Heart, and the city's first 10-story building. Waldron was a member of Newark's Board of Education, president of the city council, and a director of several banks and insurance companies. From the world of entertainment, there is Eva Marie Saint and Malcolm McGregor. Eva Marie Saint made her name as an actress early on in her career when she won an Academy Award for her role in On the Waterfront with Marlon Brando. A native of Newark, she acted in other iconic films, North by Northwest, A Hatful of Rain, and Exodus among them. She also appeared on many TV shows or made-for-TV films, as well as Broadway. Saint was nominated for five Emmy Awards and won one for the TV miniseries People Like Us. The campus building at Bowling Green University, where she graduated, was named in her honor. Malcolm McGregor packed a lot of living into his 52 years. Born in Newark, he was educated in private schools and at Yale, where he was both an intercollegiate swimming and diving champion. He and a Yale classmate were the first persons to sail a wind-driven vessel through the Panama Canal. McGregor was intent on becoming an actor from an early age and set out for Hollywood in 1920. Two years later, he landed his first movie role in The Prisoner of Zenda. Between 1922 and 1937, McGregor appeared in 55 movies, usually supporting leading ladies. But when sound came to pictures, his career began to tail off, and his last film was as a gangster in the low-budget movie Special Agent K-7. Last, but certainly not least, is the Irish patriot James Connolly. James Connolly is a revered figure in Irish history. For his efforts on behalf of workers as well as an Ireland free of British rule, but also because he died for his beliefs in the uprising of 1916 that led to Irish independence. He was born in Scotland to Irish parents and was an active socialist there in Ireland and abroad. He came to the U.S. in 1903 and lived in Newark for several years, writing, speaking, and working at a nearby sewing machine factory. In 1910, Connolly resumed his work in the labor movement in Ireland. There are statues of him in the U.S. and Ireland, and he was named one of the 100 Greatest Britons in a BBC production. That's quite an impressive list, as I'm sure you'll agree. As a final note, no mention of the Irish in Newark is complete without a mention of McGovern's Tavern on New Street. Opened in 1936 by Frank McGovern, the pub is known as a popular gathering room place throughout the state, if not the country. Frank McGovern, who came to the U.S. in the 1920s, retired from the business in 1968, but family members have kept the place up and running ever since. It's a great spot to go and have a pint of Guinness while contemplating all the wonderful achievements and contributions the Irish have made to Newark. Thank you for listening, and may the wind always be at your back.